All right. Hey, Beth. Hey, Wendy. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. Can you let people know uh, just a five minute Cliff Notes version of who you are, what you're about, where you are in this wild, wacky world? Sure. Um, so I'm here in Northern Colorado, loving it, loving the mountains. I live here with my husband of 24 years and three teenagers who are 19, 16, and 13. Um, the oldest is already gone in college and he actually goes to school in our town, but we still never see him. Um, <laughs> Nice. So that's my family life. I am currently doing a couple different things, wearing two different hats. Uh, my husband and I own a counseling center, and my role there is strategic initiatives. So I'm trying to take us outside of the box um, in terms of traditionally the way we think of counseling and get us into some different spaces and creating some different pathways of client care. And that's been really fun and new for me to dabble into that business world, but we co own it. And so it's just fun to work together. And then I have this whole other side of my, my world, and that is Fierce and Lovely. Um, I have a podcast where my goal is to amplify the feminine voice and curate feminine glory so that my listeners find their own fierce and lovely story. And I also write monthly travel guides where I curate a day in a well-known city through the lens of the women who helped shape it. And then I do kind of boutique urban immersion mother-daughter experiences where we just dive into the tension of poverty and privilege and um, really look at what does it look like to be a fierce and lovely young woman um, through those. And so that keeps me busy as well. I love doing all of that. So that's you, me in a nutshell. You said two different hats. I heard like at least 10 different hats right there. <laughs> they, they feel like two categories right now at least. For sure. For sure. Tell me more about the counseling part. How did you guys get to own this co-own this business and how did you step into the sphere of being able to be like, hey, let's do something a little different. Let's shake things up. Oh, well, we moved to Colorado nine years ago and we came right out of grad school and my husband had just gotten a master's in counseling psychology, but out of his grad program and with a close friend during that season of life, they launched a ministry. So the, the goal of moving to Colorado was actually, let's start this ministry. It was a new way of doing men's ministry. And so here we were wanting to start that. I was doing my own thing, which is another hat, um, human trafficking stuff. But my husband, we, I mean, we needed to pay the bills. So sure. he's like, well, I do have a counseling degree. So he started seeing clients and it just grew and grew and grew. And then we were bringing on new people, mostly from his grad program who did therapy the way he did it. And so for about eight years, we were building three things. We were mm. growing this counseling center. Um, he was growing this ministry called Restoration Project. I was growing an anti-human trafficking um, organization here in our region, and it was nuts. It was sure. just crazy. So last year, I ended up walking away from the human trafficking stuff and really came fully into the counseling space to help um, to grow it. And the reason we started thinking differently is because um, we were – receiving a lot of interest from individuals who did not have a license, were not master's level, but were innately counselors sure. and doing incredible work with people and maybe had a you know, certificate or spiritual direction or some, some other form of training. And they were some of our most sought after we, we started allowing them to do some work with us. We didn't know sure. what to call them. And they became our most sought after people because wow. they were doing story work with people. They weren't doing therapy. We were very clear about that, but they right. were diving into a deep story and people were beginning to experience incredible freedom. So it got our wheels turning a little bit and individuals like that are not bound as, as much by code of ethics and state law. And so they can actually do things online. And so we were having ministry missionaries from all over the world, being able to receive care um, in a different way. Folks who, you know, live in remote rural areas who are able to do some online work with some of those spiritual counselors is what we've called them for the time being. So it's just, we've begun to think, okay, maybe things can look a little different than they have in the past. And um, it's brought us more onto, into an online digital space as we begin to brainstorm um, other ways to serve people in this 
tech world. Um, so starting to capitalize on that more. I love that because that is just like the way our world works now, right? Like you, some people just can't go to an office, like for one hour a week, you got to find babysitting or whatever, you know, and to coordinate that is a pain. And then sometimes like, I know for us in the past, it's always been like, oh, well, our copay and blah, blah, blah and everything. And it just gets to be too much. And then before you know it, you've dropped it. Right. And, or sometimes you just don't mesh with this person, you know, and you need like that one-on-one, -on -one, like, Act, like they're sharing, you're sharing, and it's just like a back and forth, you know, almost like a ten tennis match, right? But it's just more personal and there's like healing in that. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought up story work too, because that is right where my heart is. Is your mm -hmm. husband an Allender Center guy? He is, yes. Oh, see? <laughs> I love it. I love are, it. Are you a, a certificate, Allender Center's I'm certificate not a or a grad? certificate person yet that's a goal that i'm working towards i did some of their um their story sage classes mm -hmm. online and because of the expense for the certificate i'm saving over the next year to be able to do that but in the meantime I'll be working on my lay and biblical counseling mm -hmm. certificate so and then i'll just add that on top and then take those you know yes when i can afford them <laughs> Yes. Um, so yeah, I love Dr. Dan Allender. I only discovered him probably a year ago. And it's funny because I have several friends in Fort Collins where you're at. They're all counselors. All of y'all. Y'all should like start a little co-op. Meet we regularly. Have, well, we do have a lot of Allender grads here in our center. Okay. Um, that's, I mean, it's our preference in that we just speak the same language and have yeah. the same background. Um, but we've started our own in-house institute for those who don't have that narrative story work um, background so that they can really learn kind of the, the framework through which we do things here. There's someone out of Michigan, too, not to get off topic, that uh, like got permission from the Allender Center to be able to certify them through this program, but for it to be like um, less expensive and like more... Like they, you wouldn't have traveled to Seattle. They come to you or something. Uh, one of the the gals that I talked to, she's an Allender Center person, and she was telling me about that too. Mm -hmm. I forget what it's called though, but I just love that it it spreads and it's just yes. like, are you an Allender Center person? <laughs> yes, awesome. <laughs> you begin to speak a similar language and you hear yes. it, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I just, I love um, getting to know you and hearing all about you, but I, what I really want to hear is, you know, how did you even get here? Like, what brought you to this place of where you're at right now? You talked about doing anti-trafficking work. You talked about counseling. You talked about the many hats that you wear, but who is Beth, Beth Bruno and where do you come from? Hmm. Where do I come from? Uh, I love that question that God asks Hagar at the well. Where have you come from and where are you going? I started my journey. Um, I would say it's partially personality and partially nurture and partially um, just all of the circumstances in life, right, that have combined to make me who I am and bring me to this day. But I've always been pretty driven and ambitious and wanted to do life differently than what was at home. And so I left right out of high school and really never, I never moved back. Um, so we lived in rural Virginia and I went to Chicago for my big adventure and I had a lot of big dreams, but I was a new Christian and had become a Christian through Young Life Ministry in high school. And so I, I was wanting to grow, but I also was wanting to make a lot of money and have a really important job and work in a skyscraper sure. and wear cute business suits. Yeah. So um, that ambition at least got me to Chicago where God began to really work on my heart and showed me some of the city that I didn't know, know existed and it just wrecked me. And I just gained a vision for the marginalized, for the poor, uh, changed my major, changed my plans, went into urban um, ministry right out of school. So he really began to work on my heart and give me a bigger vision, a bigger story to live for than my own ambition. Um, I wouldn't, I didn't know at the time, but looking back, I realized I'd be, I was still just as ambitious. I just directed it toward ministry because I, I got married. We got married um, right out of school and began to you know, think through what, what are we going to do? What's the big story we're going to live for? The ambitious goal. And um, 
lots of little stories led us to Istanbul, Turkey. And in terms of ambition, that was the largest country, unreached country in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we moved to the largest neighborhood in the largest city in the largest unreached country in the world. (laughs) Are you Um, an Enneagram person by chance? I am. I'm a one. Really? Okay. I was my husband's an eight. (laughs) Oh, geez. You know, there's certain numbers that just kind of go together. And I I feel like ones and eights, sevens and nines, eights and nine, you know, my husband is a nine uh, wing eight. So I feel you on that. Um, But the way that you talked about ambition and and drive really made me think three. So I know I can't hear more about that. Well, I think it's the the one, the reformer in me to right the world's wrongs is really where God gripped my heart. Um, And to do so in a very principle-driven, perfect way, which is why I went to the largest neighborhood in the largest city in the largest unreached country (laughs) and did ministry, college student ministry, because we were convinced that if we could reach the, the elite, the future leaders of the country, we would you know, impact the entire country. It was very strategic, very one of me um, <laughs> to go do that at age 22, I think wow. is 20, 23 when we first went over there. And so that turned into 10 years, basically 10 years of being on full-time staff with a uh, crew and living seven of those years in Istanbul, Turkey, doing college student ministry, really letting all of those, um, all of that desire to care for the marginalized that God had awakened in college, just letting that go dormant because we were, we were living on principle in Istanbul. That was our focus for so long. Um, Tell me more about that. Unpack that a little bit so we can kind of understand what you mean by that. um, The principle that the best use of our life, the, the best use of our time was to reach the most strategic people group in the most strategic city. Mm. Um, that defined, uh, our focus and it felt very justifiable. It felt sure. really good in the Christian world. Um, we were on some pretty high pedestals mm. and we just felt so needed and that kept us there far longer than we needed to stay, should have stayed. Mm. And so gradually, as you might imagine, uh, we began to wither. Sure. And became more and more weary because that's, that's a pretty shallow reason to stay somewhere. And it's not a great motivation to keep you in something for the long haul. I just think of every time that I have been on a pedestal or put myself up on a pedestal, how God just comes and goes like, come here, let me just knock you off this for a minute. So what did that look like for you? Well, I think... I do see those attempts. The problem is that it felt like the pedestal just got higher. Sure. Um, we, we went through some pretty hard stuff. My husband was stabbed. Um, our teammates were murdered. We were there for 9-11. We were there for the Iraq invasion. Lots of bombings. Bombings right next to my son's preschool. Lots of some things that would bring us to our knees. But they were things that the American church just just increase the size of the pedestal. You know, sure. you're, you're living through that. Um, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, God's attempts to, to have us draw even closer to him, which was happening, was also the thing that kept us there even longer. You know, mm-hmm. that just increased or needed here. How could we possibly leave our team? I, I can't think of the word uh, for it, but it just it almost just validates that in your head of like, oh, I'm living exactly what the original like church was living. And so that just validates me even more. I'm definitely doing God's work here. There's no way I can leave. Like, is that kind of just the running reel of, of what you heard over and over? Well, we call it the ministry Acts 29, you know, the unwritten mm, yeah. chapter of Acts, the, the fulfillment of the early church's mission in that land. Um, Tell me that's not over spiritualizing a, a life. So yes. yes, that was definitely there. Um, other things, just feeling like we're there aren't a lot of language ready leaders here. Um, there's so few believers here. That's just the need um, felt 
so large in our responsibility to the to those people and so the very things that are our glory right just responsible risk takers leaders were also the things that kept us in an unhealthy place um, did you ever have that thought of well if i leave who's going to dot 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 yeah, yeah. yes yes um that's usually the worst place to be in ministry, isn't it? Yes, yes. Because now you're Jesus. You're, you know, you're like putting yourself in his place. Like it, it's, yeah, I've Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I think a lot of people, especially a lot of young, um, passionate, Jesus-loving people, um, go out, we go out in our twenties thinking we're going to change the world yes. and that it's a calling and it's God leading and not recognizing our own pride, um, our own grandiosity in yeah. all of that. The ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me what that looked like 10 years down the road. Hmm. It was time to go home. We had a seven, four and one year old. We had been suffering with some our direct leaders for about two years really hard lots of mediation and just difficulty we were so tired of living different lives depending on who we were talking to so we were never ever missionaries we were either business owners or um, hosting international students or you know sometimes we were helping the turkish church but just a lot of um living duplicitous it felt duplicitous lives but just having to put on different hats to protect the work um, depending on who we were talking to that had really worn on us and the city itself just the concrete jungle of a mega city and our frequent attempts to find life in that that were thwarted by the enemy um, little things like we bought a dog thinking this will make us feel normal and the dog died of a heart murmur just you know weeks after getting it or um, finding a place that had a little plot of grass and thinking this you know green will give us life help our souls to breathe and our staff our leader said you can't live there that like what would everyone say if you had a place that nice um, and having to fight for that. Finding a park that was spacious and almost like a forest and getting up really early on Saturdays to go out there and then hitting traffic for a three hour drive back into the city mm -hmm. later that afternoon. Just lots of thwarting of our attempts to even take care of our souls. Um, and so we began to pray vigorously. Lord, we, we, because we couldn't just leave, because we were way too responsible and everything was um, resting on us, we really began to pray, you'd have to be really clear about what you were leading us to. We would, there's no way we can just leave for nothing. You have to really specify what is next for us. And he worked through that as, as sinful and prideful as all of that was, he worked through it. And we discovered Dan Ellender and some of his books and just began to read and read. And a year before we left Turkey, we actually flew out to Seattle and did kind of a preview at the school and decided this, I think this is the next step. At, at the very least, it's, a, it's gonna be the place where we retool and revision. Mm -hmm. um, and the plan was I would get the counseling degree and Chris would get the MDiv. Um, so anyways, we spent the a last year in Turkey with a different perspective of we are being led to the next phase of life. Therefore, we're going to establish a leadership structure that will be here in our absence. And it gave us a full year to do that well. And we felt really good about that year. We felt specifically called to the next thing. And it was five weeks before we were boarding the plane when our teammates were killed. And that just, it was the enemy just, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, it was horrendous. But for us personally, it was that question, that doubt, are you really going to leave now? Now that um, two of the top, one, of, one was one of the top leaders, my husband was another one, the third was already in America on furlough. Are you really going to abandon everyone now at wow. this moment in their greatest time of need? Um, 
And so it threw us for a spin. The last month was brutal and getting on the plane to leave was torture. We felt like complete failures and um, deserters. So it's just been interesting to look back at the, um, the work of God in our lives, the work of the enemy in our lives, the, the lies that we believe and the stories we tell ourselves and to untangle all of that. It's been a journey. I would say it took at least seven years after Turkey to really process all of that and, and debrief um, and live differently. It was a long journey. Tell me about, you said once the kid, how old were the kids when you left? Seven, four, and one. Okay. Tell me about them coming back. What are, do they still share memories of those places? Do they, was, was it an adjustment? I mean, they were all born over there, right? So what was that like? Only one was technically born there, but they all, yes, grew up there for those years. The, it was hardest for the seven-year-old that first year. Um, lots of grieving, lots of feeling like a foreigner in an American public school. All of those little adjustments of this is the Pledge of Allegiance. This is what running bases around looks like. This is the guy's voice coming out of the intercom every morning. That's your principal. Like, all of those little things that any foreigner would experience, um, he was experiencing. But soon, I mean, it was only a year, and he, they had forgotten Turkish, and America was now normal and familiar. And their memories became um, legend, lore, kind of this, this mystical place that our family talked lovingly about. And we would sing happy birthday in Turkish. And we talked, we had Turkish friends frequently visiting and we would eat Turkish food. And so it was kept alive in our family, but in this mystical way to them. Nostalgic. It's really interesting. Myst yeah, and just this kind of vague other, other life. And so as they got older, we realized there was a sense of unrootedness that for Chris and I and the amount of conversation in our family, this was a really significant place that they had these weird fantasies about. And so we felt the need to root them more in that part of their story. And so when, my, when each of them turned 12, we took them back uh, individually and oh, cool. just helped them to experience that. And, and then Finally, a year and a half ago, we decided it's time that our entire family returns together and kind of closes the Bruno story in Turkey. And so we all went back and just, we took them to the, you know, where Chris was stabbed and we um, showed them some significant places of our story that when they were 12, they weren't ready to hear, but older, they were ready to hear. And we just celebrated we blessed our younger selves chris and i and um we just really closed that part of our story and it was so healing for all of us and important we felt before our son went to college to sure. do that together so that's kind of been a post-turkey journey for the kids that's beautiful i love that i love that you're not only doing the work um of story in your lives but you're making sure to foster that in your children's too. Mm -hmm. I think we miss mm -hmm. that sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's pretty important for us. Chris and I do a lot around intentional fathering, intentional mothering. We've both written books on that, um, creating a year long rites of passage for our son, our daughters. And so we talk a lot about rooting our kids in the family narrative. Uh, when they're born or when they're adopted, when they join a family, they join a moving train. That family narrative has already been going and they're brought into it and it continues. And if we don't give them a strong sense of what that is and some of the shaping stories that influence and impact day to day in the family, um, we, we believe that they're, it's not as easy then as they get older to really cast a vision of where are you going what story is God telling through you um, in your life? So we root them in, our, in their family stories so that later we can say, um, what will your story be? And we think that that untethers them 
and frees them um, to live into the vision God has for them. So we, we do talk a lot about that in our family. Is that more so that it's easier for them to, like you said, un- untether was the word that you used, but like be launched out into the world then? I think it gives them a groundedness. Um, a sense of this is where I come from, this is who we are, and so that is settled. There's not a lot of questions or turmoil or unanswered questions in that, and so from that strong foundation, they get to explore and look forward and be curious uh, more about the story God's writing in them because there's that settledness in their soul um, of knowing who they are. So give me like a practical example of that. Like what could, what do you guys do in your family that, that kind of cultivates that? Mm -hmm. Well, so my youngest was one when we left. No memories whatsoever of Turkey. She was actually born in Virginia when we were home on furlough. And so I could have, for her, the launch of her rites of passage here, we could have gone back to Virginia. And this is where you were born, and this is kind of when you came to be. But that wasn't an important, that's not an important part of her story. She never wonders, what's Charlottesville like? Or sure. what was that hospital like? Um, she wonders, what was Istanbul like? Where did I come home to after? Um, what, what is that city that you guys talk so much about that has shaped our family, even though I was barely a part of it? Yeah. And so it was important to take her back there. But even when we went back, it wasn't really the house that she spent her first year of life in or the park that her babysitter took her to all of the time. It was just the, the place, the, all of the emotion that we carry with us and the food that we lovingly and excitedly eat whenever we find Turkish food. Um, it was just being able to experience, okay, this is the place that my parents love. And this is the place that my adventuresome, risk-taking, explorer parents took us to and did life here and walking the streets and seeing the chaos and the crazy and thinking, this is who my mom was Mm. as a young mom. And this is, this is what it was like for her to cart us around in this city. So it gives her some context in terms of who her parents are today and the kinds of decisions that we make today that affect her. It's rooted in that part of our journey. Um, And so she just needed to experience that. And there was a sense for her of just, I can't even describe it, just a sense of settledness. I now know what the rest of you know. I've now experienced what the rest of you have held. Um, And so I'm fully a part of this Bruno family and this part of the Bruno story. I I don't know. That sounds vague, but it was so concrete. It reminds me of what Dan Allender says when he's talking about writing your story about experiencing the the senses, right? Like, what does it smell like there? What does it look like there? What's the feeling that you get there? And so, yeah, when you guys talk about that and like it would almost, she might almost feel excluded. But now that she has seen and experienced and understands, it's like the puzzle pieces come together. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it's no longer this mystical place. It's, it's a concrete place and she has concrete categories, you know, to put things into. Mm, I like that. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So tell me about what life looks like now. You guys have been back for. We've been back for 12 years. Even though it doesn't feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Feels like just yesterday. Um, but in those years, you guys spent time in Seattle, and now you've been in Fort Collins for the last mm-hmm. nine years. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about the anti-trafficking organization and how yeah. that came to be. Mm-hmm. So we moved to Seattle, and Chris started at the Seattle School first, and within the first semester decided, I don't want an MDiv. I want to be a counselor. So mm-hmm. he switched. 
And I started feeling like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be a counselor, actually. So the plan was I would transition our family and take that first year and just reorient ourselves to the States. And during that time, I'm wrestling personally, and my friends are saying, hey, do you know about this? Or, hey, have you watched this? Or, hey, have you read this book? And one of my friends asked me to watch a documentary called Born Into Brothels. And it was about a photographer, British photographer, who went to Calcutta, worked in the red light district, taught the children who were living in the brothels photography and got their work into an exhibit and sold it. And the proceeds um, went to getting them into boarding schools. It, It rocked my world. It was my first exposure to modern day slavery. First time I had heard of this thing called sex trafficking. And my the first time I had seen art being used for social change. Mm. And I was a photographer dabbling in photography already at that point. And so I just, it was one of those nights. I just wept and wept and it was a before and after night for me. Um, And so post that movie, I found a program also in Seattle called International Community Development. And I enrolled in that, and it was the study of all the things going wrong in the world. It was a perfect program for an Enneagram One. (laughs) Um, And so we studied all the issues, including human trafficking, and then all of the various solutions that people are trying around the world in, in terms of community development. And so my thesis was the use of photography in community development. And how could we invert the power paradigm, put the camera into community members' hands so that they could really tell their own story and instigate their own social change um, from a place of power and and as the author and not just the subject or the object of change, which is what so much of humanitarian photography was about back then. So out of that program, I launched a nonprofit called A Face to Reframe. And the idea was to reframe with dignity those who had been marginalized. And so as we moved to Colorado, Chris with Restoration Project and me with A Face to Reframe, that's what we both were starting um, in those those early days. And I connected with, I mean, what was I going to do at that point with young kids? I couldn't travel the world and do these photography projects all around the world. So I was looking for who's doing what here in Colorado. And especially around human trafficking, which was my particular interest in all of the possible ones. And I found a group in Denver working with the youth living on the streets. And um, we did a photography project. And I began to learn about domestic sex trafficking. Mm. In Seattle, even as I was learning about human trafficking, our perception back then in 2008, 2009, around trafficking was It happens in port cities, border towns, Asians, massage parlors, things like that. So when I was working with kids on the street in Denver and seeing what they were doing to survive and what they were willing to trade for basic necessities, I began to see, Mm -hmm. oh, this is what it looks like here in the States. And gosh, these kids look a whole lot like the kids coming out of my son's middle school. Sure. Um, And so again, it was another another one of those wrecking moments that launched me into trying to discover what's going on locally in our state and eventually became the one that galvanized our region um, because nothing was happening and just began training community agencies and law enforcement and then moved into high schools doing youth prevention, sometimes using photography, sometimes using other art, but just really doing a whole lot of presentations on this is what it is. This is what it looks like in a community like ours. And here's what you do when you see red flags. Yeah. Um, and that just grew and grew and grew. And so we started several different coalitions up here um, and really stood in the gap for about six years until state law changed and caught up. Different mandates were came down for child welfare and law enforcement organized themselves around some working groups and things began to change enough to where I started to feel like I don't need to stand in the gap anymore. And this is also really has become quite weary for me um, Mm -hmm. on just so dark to talk about pimps and porn and prostitution day after day after day. And so that's where I began to transition out in 2018. But that 
that was, I ended up doing community development. Um, I had no idea. It took me a while to realize, oh, this is actually my degree. I'm doing what <laughs> we studied. It's not overseas, but I'm using the same principles to galvanize this community around an issue I care about and empower them to do what they can within their sphere of influence and then step out of the middle of it all and let them flourish. Um, so it felt really good to close and I dissolved a face to reframe last December. Wow. What's that been like kind of debriefing from that? The year of transition was a year of wrestling my own ego. Mm -hmm. um, which, given the story of Turkey, you can imagine is a thing for me, sure. um, feeling like I lead things, I start things, I, um, and I loved all that, I loved the relationships I had um, for the first time, all of these beautiful secular relationships with non-ministry people. It was awesome. And the thought of no longer being the one that people came to, um, no longer being needed, no longer being known. It, I, I named it. I mean, I knew that that was at work. Yeah. And the letting go, the untangling myself from the middle of it all was a dying to self um, and letting my ego go um, for, for what I knew was right, not only for the community, but for my own soul and for the family. Mm. Um, but it, it, was, it was an active wrestling match for months until it wasn't. And it just felt better and better and better. Um, and now it just feels really right. But it was hard. Going from these big roles and these big, you know, like you said, pedestal kind of positions. And now you're leading something with your husband and you're doing, but you're also just a helper and not the full front face of it all. That's got to be a humbling act in and of itself, but it's also a break. <laughs> it, it is and it isn't. Um, what's beautiful is the what we both bring to different spaces. And there are times, I mean, in the counseling world, yes, he's the, he's the counselor. It is more like that. Um, but we overlap in so many different ways, particularly because of our books and the parenting space. So a lot of times we're on stages together now, um, or there's always a counterpart. We're, we're getting, getting to go to Africa in February. He'll do a father-son retreat. I'll do a mother-daughter um, experience. So there's a lot of collaborative work. Kenya. Ooh, beautiful. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we're That'd excited. So it's not fully like that, but I would say that 10 years ago, that would have been really difficult, really difficult. I mean, that was one of the biggest struggles of being on crew staff, was always feeling like I'm his wife, I'm their mother. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of pos position, title. Um, that's partially the organizational culture, partially Turkish sure. culture. And so it would have been harder. I think now it feels like just a joy to build something together um, and have goals and be in a business for so, you know, after ministry for so long to, to learn what it looks like to have a ministry hearted business mm. and to find purpose and um, delight in running a business that still serves people, but sure. it's, it's profitable. And it's, that's been a mindset shift. Um, and that's it's, okay. It's Imagine okay. That. <laughs> Imagine that. You don't have to be poor your entire life just doing ministry and just, it's okay. You can make exactly. a paycheck. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I think yes. sometimes for men that has been more like, oh, it's okay because that's his profession. But for women, I feel like we've really struggled to be like, oh, I can accept money for this. Okay. I guess. Sure. You know, not too much, not a lot. Oh my goodness. I'm a part of a, a writer's guild and we're constantly talking about speaking fees and women's retreats and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's actually really sad what we settle for. Yes. How we actually by settling or by saying it's, I'll just, 
it's just a ministry. I'll just come for free or I'll come for $50. We actually ruin it for all of us. We're yes. devaluing all of us across the board. Um, very few men would go speak at a retreat for free. Um, <laughs> so as women, we need to rally around each other a little bit better in that space. If not just for ourselves, like you said, for one another, for the next one, because yes. eventually there's someone coming in behind you and you want to be able to be that role model for her who's looking to you, who's trying to see at that young age in her immaturity, is this okay? Is it okay? She's asking permission, right? Should she be? No, but she's asking you for permission mm -hmm. we need to give her the permission. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love it. Beth, you're a delight. Okay. We, everything that you've said, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've done that too. I've done that too. I've had that same thought. So we mm. have been living parallel lives. You live <laughs> in a city also named Fort something. See? Yes. It's meant what to be. <laughs> and technically we know all the same people, like all the Allender Center people. So there we yes. go. Yeah. That's so fun. Be. Well, can you give everyone just the rundown of like where they can find you, if they're local to your area, if you have a website where they can follow you on social and all mm -hmm. that good stuff? Sure. The Counseling Center is Restoration Counseling. Um, so Restoration Counseling NoCo, northerncolorado.com, uh, or Restory Colorado. And actually, we have an office in Austin, restoryaustin.com. Oh, cool. um, so that's where people can find us there. For me, it's bethbruno.org, and I have a whole um, library full of cool resources, including those monthly city guides. I think I've done eight now, seven or eight, and so access to all of that is just by hopping on to bethbruno.org freebies, and people can, can find that. My podcast, it's on the website as well, but that's called Fierce and Lovely. Um, so those are good places to start. Awesome. Thank you so much for this conversation, Beth. I absolutely love hearing more about you, getting to know you. And I know that people are going to be touched by your story. And I think we touch on a lot of really sensitive subjects for women. And I believe that that's healing for them to be able to hear it come out of someone else's mouth and not just replay in their brain constantly. Hmm. So I love yes. it. Well, thanks for having me.